chapter 24. We're going to be reading the whole chapter tonight and make some a few remarks. And um, then I'm going to talk to you about the apostles because it is the apostles who ask the questions that gets Christ into this part. We're going to go into the end time study. Basically, the end time study means what? What? When I say end times, what do you think about? End of the world, right? I mean, end of time. End of chronological time. You know this as well as I do. God lives out time, outside of time and space. Does that make sense to you? If, 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 if this is time and space, right? This piece of paper, this white piece of paper is time and space. God is bigger than time and space. He would be more like I am upside of this. Meaning he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. Meaning that when time was started over in Genesis chapter 1, God was here. He was bigger than the beginning. And he's bigger than the end. And he is the same all the way through. That's why he can know the end from the beginning. Nothing stinks up on him. He is above. And time and space has been created for you and I as a point of reference. You understand what I'm saying? It's a marker that we can go back to and say, at this specific place, this specific time. But God, well, a day is like what to Him? A thousand years, right? I mean, it, it, time has no bearing on Him. But uh, when we think about the end of time or the end of uh, earth, all of creation, there are a lot of different theories about it. Uh, there is a theory that God will end, before He ends the earth, that He will call His children home in rapture. And then there will be a stance called the Great Tribulation. And at the end of that, uh, Jesus Christ will return to earth. There will be a period where He deals with Satan and we, He sets up His earth here, His kingdom here on earth, uh, which would be the thousand year reign or the millennium. And then at that, at the end of that, God will put an end to all evil, casting the hell and Satan himself into the bottomless pit. Basically, that theory is what we call, that theory is called pre-tribulation rapture and uh, theory. Then there's another one that believes that in the midst of the seven years, uh, about three and a half years, God will rapture his people, the church, and uh, they'll be called home, and that is mid-trib. And then there is those who believe that the church will go through tribulation. And then at the end of that time, Christ will come and set up His kingdom here on earth. And uh, there's all different kinds of it. But here's the thing, and I'm going to talk with you about a lot of it, but the thing is, is this, is that none of what we have talked about and that we are going to talk about in my book is reason to separate fellowship. Does that make sense? Based on all of this, Everything, it's going to be our best understanding of what the Bible says. Some of the greatest men that you'll ever read behind, John Calvin, different ones like that, they would not even write commentaries on end time stuff because they, number one, we'll never be sure about it until we're called home. And number two, it's just not that important if we're living for the things of God. He's got the whole world in his hands, and praise God, he's got the end in his hands. And if you're like me, you can get so caught up in end times theories that you're no good for this world. You get so caught up in looking and judging and all this. You don't witness. You don't tell others about Christ. You don't do all that. All we know is that, yes, Christ is coming again. Those that have loved Him and been saved. And we're going to go through this study. We're going to, we're going to do all that. But what I want you to know tonight is if you don't agree with me in that study, that's fine. And I probably ain't going to agree with you in some things. Amen? But I believe we can start in the book of Revelation. We can start in the book of Daniel. We can start in the book of Thessalonians. But I believe the best place to begin is the very words of Christ Jesus Himself. Letters in red. Why? Because He is the one that's coming again. Amen? And He looks at it. And so tonight we're going to read this whole chapter of chapter, you don't have to stand, chapter 24. And then we'll talk a little bit about it. Chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, this is a beautiful temple. Huge temple. Gorgeous. Matter of fact, this temple has been built by the Roman government. It's been built and all the money has been spilled on this specific temple because Rome is trying to get into, into good fellowship and have a good relationship with the Jewish people. 
He knows how much, Rome knows how much the Jewish people think of their temple and how important it is in their religion. And so Rome, as a, a will of good faith, has begun to build, Herod the Great, it started building this in around uh, 19 to 20 B.C., before Christ was ever born, they began to build this temple. And Jesus and his disciples, apostles, are admiring this temple. Verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all of these things? Look at all this, boy. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, now notice there probably went on a little bit, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. Even our sheriff yesterday talked about how as he looks at it, we are in the midst of a great falling away. Great falling away. How that people are pulling away from the things of God. Uh, because of the lust of the flesh. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now if you want to put a note out beside that about here's a reference where we can go to study. That would be Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And Daniel chapter 12 verse 11. Daniel chapter 12 verse 11. Now see why I said start in the red? What is he doing? He is referencing us to other studies. We begin by the very one who was there at creation himself. Verse 16, Then let him, let them which be in the Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be greater tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days were shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. If 23, if any man uh, shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the son of the coming of the Son of Man be. Now notice, I believe what he's saying right there, that when Christ returns, it's not going to be hidden. It's not going to be in secret, right? When you see lightning pop forth, you know that lightning just struck, right? Right. I, I mean, I'm just, we're not deep studying here tonight. We're just going by what the Scripture says. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. Immediately thereafter, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. 
And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to another. You can look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. You'll see a beautiful picture of God telling us believers when we use a, when we lose a loved one in Christ Jesus that we do not have to mourn as others who mourn because we have a hope that one day with the voice of the archangel and the sound of a trumpet the dead in Christ will rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together and there, there to be reunited with all those that have loved Christ Jesus. Verse 32 Now learn a parable of the fig tree which when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Now, some of you that's heard in times and been taught, what is the fig tree supposed to represent here? Israel. 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 That's, that's always been what I've been taught. I mean, that's been the basic Baptist doctrine, right? Verse 33. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things near, that is, that when ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things have been fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of the day and of the hour no man knoweth, but not no, not the angels of heaven, not but my Father only. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, mark that right there because that's going to be an answer to a question. The coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be taken in the field, one shall be left, and the other, one shall be taken and the other one left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken and the other one left. Watch ye, there, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord cometh. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man come, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath ruled, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all good things, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of the servants shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God add his blessings to this reading. I want to jump back real quick over to verse 44 and 45. No matter what we believe, no matter where our study takes us as we begin the study of the end times, the last day. We can never forget what it says right here in 44 and 45. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Notice, one thing we need to be remembered, that Christ can come any day. Any day can be the last day. And number two, we need to be doing what we're doing. We need to be doing what Christ has called us to do. Faithful in our relationship with Him, 
faithful in our service towards Him and telling others, trying to win others to the kingdom of God. Because we may not get anything else right, but what we do know is this. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And He said that we're to be the ones to carry the gospel out. Amen? If we're going to do this study, I think there's something we need to understand. That in this passage, all of these red letters, Christ is trying to answer specific questions. Right? You ever thought about that? Not only is He trying to answer a specific question, but basically, there are three specific questions. When we read over there in the first two verses where it talks about Jesus being in the temple, and Jesus and His apostles are walking around and they're admiring the beauty of the temple. A temple that basically was started building by Herod, uh, Herod the Great around 20, 19 or 20 B.C. before Christ. Uh, and it was finished around 62 to 64 A.D., meaning long after Christ died, it, had, it was finished then. It tells us over in John chapter 2, verse 20, Christ says, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it in three days, which we know He was talking about the body. But in John 2, 20, it says that this temple, the temple that Jesus is looking here, the temple that Herod the Great started building and was finished around 60-something A.D., said that it took 47 years. That's biblical. You can look that up. John 2, 20 took 47 years to build this temple. And that's the, not the original temple. That's the temple that was built by Herod the Great. And so they're walking around looking at this and Jesus says to them, I want you to look, boys. Look at how beautiful this is. Look at how all the stones are stacked on top of each other. And everything is beautiful. But I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a day that not one stone will be left on top of the other stone. And you think about it, you're looking up at this thing. We know that some of the blocks that were cut, it was so amazing that they would cut them at the quarry, bring them over to the temple, and they would fit just perfectly. And Jesus says, they're not going to be left there. Not going to be left there. And then, they go up to the Mount of Olives. They begin to think about these things. The apostles, I believe it's mainly the twelve. It could have been some others, some other disciples. But they ask the question now. Three questions. Notice in verse 3. Tell us, First question, when shall these things be? Right? What things? Well, what has He just told them? There's coming a day that these stones, the temple's going to be torn down, right? All that you see, all that we as a nation love and we worship and that's a part of our theology, there's coming a day that not one stone will be left on another, right? That's what we read in the Scripture previous to it, right? They ask him, when will this time be? When is the temple going to be destroyed? Destroyed. That's the first question, right? Based on our reading, that's the first question. The next question is this. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Okay? God, Christ Jesus, we want you to tell us when the temple is going to be destroyed. Because you've all told us it's going to be destroyed. We'd like to know when it's going to be destroyed. And we'd also like to know when is going to be the sign of thy coming. Now, we've got to remember, we've got to remember that the disciples, although they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they were expecting him to do something. Do you remember? But well, the day that he came into Israel, uh, uh, on uh, Palm Sunday. You remember what happened? He came in riding on a donkey. And remember they were throwing down their palms and they were throwing down their cloaks and they were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jehovah. Even the apostles at that time thought that he, before long, they didn't think 2,000 years down the line he's going to set up his kingdom. No. They believed that at any moment now, at least no more than a year or two, he's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to set himself up as king of kings. And so they're asking, what shall be the sign of your coming? What, when are we going, how are we going to know that it's time for you to reign? When are we going to know? And I'm going to tell you this based on their thoughts. I don't believe that the uh, kingdom, when his kingdom was established, I don't think they thought that the temple being destroyed was going to be a part of it. Now that's neither here nor there. But what we do know is they wanted to know when is your kingdom going to be established? When are you going to sit on the throne as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Just like your grandfather who? David. David did. And then here's the second one. 
or that's the second one. When shall these things be? Or when is the temple going to be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? When are you going to establish and be as Christ Jesus and King of kings? Last one. And of the end of the world. What does that mean? Tell us the signs, just like the signs that's going to show us that you're fixing to take from. Also tell us the signs of when everything's going to come to an end. Three questions. Three questions. Now, if you look over in the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 3 through 4, you're going to see almost the same exact questions except for two. There's only going to be two questions. They're going to ask these questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed, basically? And when will be the end of all things? Mark chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. Then also, if you look in the book of Luke, Luke 21, beginning in verse 7, same questions. Only the two, though, not the three. That's why here in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and I challenge you to go and study those others. They're going to line up with this. But Matthew seems to give the more in-depth answer. Number one, we get the three questions that's asked by the apostles. And we get the in-depth questions. So the first one I think we need to talk about is the temple, right? When will the temple be destroyed? How many in here tonight can tell me how many temples you can think of right now? How many temples? When I, when I preach about temples, most of us probably think about one temple, and that's the temple that Solomon built, right? The temple that Solomon built somewhere around 960 or 953 B.C., before Christ. His daddy, David, had gathered up all the supplies and everything that was needed, but he had bloody hands. And it was passed on to his son to be able to build it. And it said that the train of the Lord filled the temple. Beautiful, beautiful place. Gold. It says that the um, stones were so white that when you'd be coming into Jerusalem, the city that is set on a hill, you could be miles and miles away, but when the sun would hit on the side of the temple of Solomon, that it was so white that it would just almost just dazzle you because it was shining so great. The gold would shine. But you remember that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Broken down, all the gold was taken out of it. Even before that, they had done trading the pure gold for brass as they drifted away from God. But then, God, after He allows them to go into captivity, God, and you can read about it in uh, the book of Ezra, and you can read about it in other ones, I don't got them there, but God allows them to come back, and when they come back, as we read in Ezra and Nehemiah, that in Nehemiah, not only do they rebuild the wall, but praise God, they rebuild the temple, and they build the temple, temple number two, or the temple of Zerubbabel. I can't say it, so just go along with me, okay? The temple of Z. They rebuild that temple. But the thing about this, although it was rebuilt about 520 or 515 B.C., it never was the size of Solomon's temple and it never had the splendor, Brother John, of the temple. Matter of fact, at one point, if you read over in the book of Haggai, God gets very upset with them because God's drawn them back to their home, Jerusalem. They're rebuilding their houses and they're tiling their ceilings and making everything throw beautiful and yet they're letting the temple of God just be plain Jane. God doesn't like that. Never has the splendor. But then around 20 B.C., like I said before, Roman, Herod the Great, comes in wanting to appease, as we know, Rome's in control of all one quarter of the earth at that time. Um, and he's wanting to make nice with Jerusalem. And so they begin to rebuild. They build a platform there and they begin to rebuild. It takes 47 years to build it. Remember what I said? It was finished around, let's say, 60, about really around 62, 64 A.D. In the year 70, it is destroyed. Wiped out, torn down. The gold is taken. Matter of fact, there's so much gold that's taken from it, it affects, it makes the price of gold in the whole region go down because so much gold is taken out of the temple. So here's the question we've got to ask. And what you're going to see in our study here, Jesus is never going to really deal with the destruction of the temple. He's never going to really talk about the temple of Jerusalem being torn down. Never really going to talk about it. I'm going to tell you something and we're going to go through it in a minute. And I'm just for curiosity's sake, but do you realize that even though it was torn down in 
uh, 80, 70. There probably one, maybe three of the disciples got to see it torn down because they died for the cause of Christ before that ever happened. They were so faithful. See, here's the main questions that God is going to be answering, that Christ is going to be answering. Remember, the temple, and as we talked about, there's not really going to be much of the temple unless you want to spiritualize it and say Israel. I mean, and I'm not going to do that. We're going to take it literal. We're going to take it as God's Word. So there's the two questions, and I'm going to show you that God answers them, and then I'm going to go to you, and I want you to read and prepare for it as well. But look, okay, so we've talked about that one, that the temple was torn down, that temple, there was torn down around A.D. 70. So the next one will be this. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Notice there in verse 14. Listen to what he says. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Right? So he specifically said, they asked him a question. He wanted to know what the sign of the end of the world is. And he said, here's some things. Right there in verses 4 through whatever. Uh, 4 through verse 8. Uh, he, he, he tells them some things to be looking for. But in verse 8 he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. These are to just be expected. It's going to look bad. Things are going to get bad. Any of us today, we know life is hard. But notice what he said. This is basically to be expected. Hard times is going to come. Joseph said, man, that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. That's it. And so, see, he's, he's answering that question. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Notice in verse 22, at the end, he said, uh, but for the elect's days, those days shall be shortened. What days? The days of tribulation at the end time. He's specifically talking about the end of the world. The end of the world. Let's go on a little bit further. Um, in verse 39, verse 39, so we see, and what, Brian, why are you talk, why are you showing us these things? Because I want you to see that there are context clues. I'm not going to tell you what to believe tonight. It's for you to study this. What I'm showing you is that Christ tries to answer the question, and we'll come back later and we're going to discuss this. But you're seeing right there, the question is asked, when shall the, what shall be the signs of the end of the world? He says, this, then shall the end come. This is, these are those signs. Now, right here in verse 38, uh, excuse me, verse 39, he begins to talk about Noah and how things were in the days of Noah. And he says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Right, what do you mean by that? He's saying, study, basically what he's saying, study the times of Noah. See what was going on then. See what their attitude was because what the going on then, if you figure out what was going on then, you'll be better expecting to look at those times. So see what we see here is that there are questions that's trying to be answered. First off, when we go to study in times, let's just say we're going to study in times, right? There's no question to answer there, right? There, I mean, we're just basically jumping off into the swimming pool hoping to bump into something. <coughs> But now, now, based on God's Word, on the red letter, we've got something that we can start. There's questions that need to be answered. And so we see Christ's Word to answer those questions. And then we can jump over to Daniel. Then we can jump over to Rev uh, Revelations and all that. But we've got to know where to start if we're expecting to get the right answer. And these are the main two questions that we need to ask. What is the sign of your coming? What are the things that we can be looking for to know that you're coming? And what are the signs to know that the end of the world is going to be coming to? That's the study of the end times, right? So there's that answer right there. Any questions before we go any further tonight? Maybe not many. I hope I'm just giving you a good assignment. Keep it tied up. I'm giving you two weeks to study this. And if you want to jump over to Daniel and study about the abomination of des desolation, you go on ahead if you want some books. I've got some books that talk about the three different dispensations and things like that. You come see me during the week and call me, send me a text. I'll get those. But this is what I thought was neat is Jesus was trying to explain these questions that he told them. If you'll notice what he says, he says there in verse uh, uh, 8, notice what it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. There's certain things you need to expect. It's going to get bad, but that doesn't mean the end of the world is coming. 
But then in verse 9, he's talking to the apostles and he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And that just struck me. How did the apostles die? Did they ever really get to see the temple destroyed in 70 AD? And so I went through and I looked it up. I looked in my uh, software and I looked online. And I want you to listen. I've got 11 of the apostles and I may not have the dates that they died on all of them, but I do got some. But Peter, Simon Peter, listen to this. Peter was basically crucified around the same, uh, basically died around the same time that Paul did under the persecution of Nero, which was one of the most ungodliest kings you would ever know. He set Rome, he set the capital on fire, and after he set it on fire to keep him from getting in trouble, he blamed it on the Christians, and so then they had an opportunity to persecute Christians. Basically, Peter died about the same time, but he was going to be crucified and he found himself so unworthy to die in the like manner of Jesus that he told him to crucify him upside down around the year 67 or 68 AD. Not 70. He never got to see the temple torn down. James, the brother of John, Zebedee, father of Zebedee, he lives around uh, 44 AD. If you want to read about him dying, you can go to the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. James, the brother of John, which would be called James the Greater, is what he was called, uh, only lived about 5, maybe 11 years after Jesus died, but he was decapitated by Herod the Great. Head chopped off. Why? Because he preached the gospel of Jesus. Andrew, uh, we don't know much about Andrew, don't know what year he died, but basically he was crucified somewhere in Greece, somewhere around Turkey. Why? Because he preached the gospel. Philip, Philip is neat. He was somewhere in Carthage, somewhere around Africa, and I, could, I didn't have time to look up this word, but God, he was so uh, zealous about the gospel that there was a Roman proconsul's wife, which a proconsul is some type of authority, some kind of leader uh, in the, in the, and you remember why he's in Africa, and yeah, but Rome, remember they conquered about a quarter of the surface of the earth and, and God gave him the privilege of leading that Roman soldier, that Roman's governor's wife to the Lord. She got saved. The Roman proconsul, or the Roman leader, got so mad that Philip <coughs> had led his wife to the Lord that he had him arrested and killed in a cruel manner. But yet, man, when he stood before Jesus, he'd be able to say, I might have died, but I died because I led another one to you. Isn't that awesome? Matthew. Matthew, somewhere in the six, uh, 60s AD after his death, we're not sure, but probably somewhere in Ethiopia, he was killed by the sword for preaching the gospel of Jesus. Thomas, either in Persia or in India, um, he was preaching the gospel and he made people so mad that they had four soldiers with lances or what we would call spears run uh, Thomas through. Thomas the Doubter was no longer the Doubter. He was the one that was convicted about the cause of Christ. So convicted that four uh, spears were run through him because of the cause of Christ. James, Alphys, or James the Lesser, not because he was any less important, but because he was probably, you know, old shorty. That, that's probably what it was. But he was martyred somewhere in Egypt. And then there's Jude, which, which is called Thaddeus. He was called Thaddeus. And he was shot with arrows and killed. Um, Bartholomew, Somewhere in Armenia, he was what they called, uh, I can't remember, basically he was skinned alive and then beheaded for the cause of Christ. And then uh, Simon, the zealot, Simon was uh, crucified or either hacked to death. They know that he was martyred, but the church records don't have it quite down. So think about that. All of those, I think I just went through ten. And if you'll read, when Christ tells him, he asks me, he says, can you suffer? Can you drink from the cup that I've drank from? But I've left out one, and that is John. John the Revelator. 
Now, we've got to remember something about John. Remember, when Jesus stood on the cross, he told somebody, he said, Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Do you remember who that was? It was John. It was John. He was the adopted son of Mary. You know that? He was the only one that went to the cross. You remember that? Basically, the only one that went to the cross. Well, John, he got to live to be an old man. But he was born and old. Put on the prison island of uh, Patmos, and then he was able to get off there and he carried his book and all that, and he died finally over. He was probably one of the only ones that actually made it to 87 to see it. And he and, and, and many people would say, Well, look at him, he's blessed to get able to live to an old age. And he was faithful. He took care of Christ's mother. But you see, Brian, what's so important about that? These men were asking the same questions that you and I ask. How do we know when Christ is coming? We need to know. We want to study this. We want to make sure we get it right. And, they got, and you know what? In the end, it didn't matter. One league dog. Then they ain't never even made it to it. Right? What I'm saying is this. Don't get so caught up in it. Yes, if you believe it, believe it passionately. But don't think you got it all right. And that others have it all wrong. Because we're going to study in time to the best of our understanding. And hey, we don't know. Christ might come before the end of this day is out. Before we leave our blessed bread. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Anything on anybody's heart tonight? Any thought about end times? Yes, In Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that's probably one of my favorite verses over there. I mean, uh, and, and you know what he says about that scripture? Paul tells us something, he said, but don't believe me, it's based on God's Word. Based on God's Word. Anybody else? And remember over there where he talks about in Daniel, verse 15, uh, those scriptures are Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And then we're going to go to the end times of Revelation. We'll read all that. But I ask you to pray for me. Like I said, this will be the first time in uh, going on almost 10 to 12 years of either, or so, well, almost 15, I read, of associate or pastor, and I've never done it. I try to stay away from it, to be honest with you. Yes, sir? I, I, I don't. I, I, but to be, that's why I didn't want to get in too deep with it tonight with the sickness and everything. I don't know. And even when he says and pray that it neither be the Sabbath when they have to go, you know, I, I, I don't really understand that. I think some of it's going to boil down to Jewish custom. Because he is talking to Jews right here, some of it may have to do with the temple and the Jewish law and all that, so I, I don't know. Um, the neat thing is when he says that uh, uh, in verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. It's not talking about spiritual right there. It's talking about flesh, that there's going to be death involved. Those days are going to be so bad, the days of the tribulation are going to be so bad that it's going to be the flesh that's hurt the most. But for the elect's sake, it's going to be shortened. For the people of God, for the children of God. And remember what he says, he says this, he says that those that endure to the end shall be saved. Right? So just think about those things. There's some good things there. And here's the thing, and I don't care what you believe, and I'm gonna, we're going to take some prayer requests and do some announcements. I don't care what you believe, okay?